um, participatory economics is um, um, has been developed as an alternative to both uh, free market capitalist economics and also to uh, central planned socialist economics. So when we're thinking about um, classlessness, um, two primary tasks uh, come to mind. Uh, the first is to do with analysis, and the second is to do with vision. Sorry, speaking about vision, <coughs> I can't see anything. Say again? Speaking about vision, I can't see anything. Is it blurred? Yeah, yeah, I have good sight vision. Uh, is it no, so a bit blurred? To, we need to maybe push the button. Are you, are you saying back. it's too low? It's blurred. You need to focus. Focus. Oh, focus. oh, I see. You make, yeah, I got it. I got what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first thing is vision. Analysis and the second has to do with vision. And when we're doing analysis, we're basically looking at the current economic system in order to identify the uh, institutions within the current economy <coughs> that generates the class system. And the reason we want to identify those um, those institutions is so we can dismantle them, organise to dismantle them. Yeah. And the second primary task is vision. Um, and the reason we do vision is that vision is more about conceptualization. So we're, we're looking at conceptualizing new institutions for a classless economy. And the reason we do this is so if we can or we can channel our organisational energies and efforts and resources into constructing these new institutions. Okay. So to help us think uh, more clearly about this, I've created this grid. And what we're going to do in this session is we're going to go through, on the left-hand side, we've got our analysis, and we're going to identify four institutions that we want to organise to dismantle. And on the right, we've got our um, institutions, our four categories, and we're going, to, we're going to put institutions within those, and these are the institutions that we want to organise to construct. Um, and, yeah, and Collectively, these four represent the key institutions in a capitalist economy, and these four represent the key institutions for a participatory economy. Okay, so the first institution I want to highlight is uh, private ownership. Um, private ownership is a source of the class system um, because it elevates uh, a class. Um, basically, if you've got in a capitalist economy, you've got a um, a class of owners, and those owners make their money by taking in, taking the profits. And the rest of the rest of the um, economic actors are the working class, and they make their money by renting themselves out to the owning class. Um, and because the capitalist <coughs> class want to maximise profit, naturally, uh, and the working class want to um, maximise their hourly wage naturally, this creates a conflict of uh, economic interests, because um, obviously if the workers are successful in uh, increasing their hourly wage, uh, this eats into the profits of the capitalist class. So this creates the uh, um, an opposing economic interest. So it's the first source of, um, um, of the class system I want to highlight is uh, private ownership. So we put that into our first category there. And I would have thought that at a socialist conference like this, this is, that's quite an uncontroversial um, start. Um, the next institution might prove to be a little bit more um, controversial, we'll see. So the second institution I want to highlight as part of our analysis um, is an institution that we want to organise to dismantle is the corporate division of labour. Uh, the corporate division of labour comes about as a result of certain job formulations. So if you think of a job as being made up of a bundle of tasks, so we've got a job here, job X, and these, the, and these yellow dots are tasks. Um, that's, that's basically what a job is. But if the corporate division of labour comes about as a result of 
certain jobs being made up of empowering and desirable tasks, and other jobs are being made up of tasks that are not so empowering, not so desirable. So this job, job X, the yellow dots are basically empowering tasks, desirable tasks. Um, the red dots, dots are uh, tasks that are disempowering and not so desirable. So this creates a corporate division of labor. Yeah. Okay, so this, the corporate division of labor gives rise to a, a second class that I want to identify, which we call the coordinate class. And as we can hopefully see in this illustration, they monopolize all the yellow tasks, which are the empowering, empowering and desirable tasks within the economy. Um, and the working class uh, do all the red tasks, which are the disempowering and less desirable tasks. So the corporate division of labor, if you want a classless economy, corporate division of labor has also got to go. So I just want to uh, say a little bit more about the coordinator class because there, it might be a new concept for some of you. The coordinator class are classic professional managers who monopolise empowering tasks within the economy. Um, and basically workers carry out the orders of the coordinator class in their traditional role as, you know, ordered, or, you know on the receiving end of orders from above. And the important insight here is that uh, an anti-capitalist revolution does not equal classlessness. This is an important, very important insight. So, for example, if you remember the hierarchical system we showed, if we get rid of the capitalist class at the top, we, if we recognise the coordinated class as a third class that sits between a capitalist and a working class, if we get rid of the capitalist, we still have a class system. And uh, people, advocates of participatory economics tend to see that what happened in, say, like Russia and China in the 20th century was essentially a coordinate class revolution. <coughs> okay, so we've got the corporate division of labour as our second institution that I think we should be organising to dismantle. Um, the third institution, this is quite straightforward really, um, the third institution is remuneration for ownership and bargaining power. <coughs> now I think this is quite straightforward because we've already got rid of, or we've already identified that we need to get rid of private ownership. So we're not going to be remunerating for ownership if we've already got rid of private ownership by definition. And if we've got rid of the corporate division of labour, we've also got rid of remuneration for bargaining power. Yeah, we can come back and explore these. This is this is. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then we can come back and re re look at all this. Okay. So basically, we've got rid. Uh, we've we've got rid of uh, ownership and the corporate division of labour. So we've addressed this already, but we need to highlight it because we do need to have an alternative criteria for remuneration. So that's why it's in there. Okay, so remuneration for ownership and bargaining power is our third institution that uh, our analysis leads us to kind of hone in on in terms of what we need to be organising to, to dismantle if we want to class this economy. Okay, so the, the fourth institution, this is the, um, this is probably the more di most difficult one to explain very briefly, uh, but basically competitive markets need to go. Um, competitive markets need to go because they essentially generate um, uh, a context, an overall context for the economy whereby um, it generates a logic um, that rationalises the maintenance or the reintroduction of uh, elitist institutions. So for example, if you imagine two workplaces operating within um, a competitive market context, and say they're both making clocks or something like that, and you've got, in order to survive, this business needs to outcompete this business, and this business needs to outcompete this business. And one of the ways in which you can outcompete your competitor is by cutting wages, reducing health and safety measures, da 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 da. Um, and the only way, the only real sensible way of doing that is by having a managerial class to impose it on the working class. The working class are not, not very good at doing that to themselves. 
So they basically, we need a managerial class uh, to, to, to impose these harsh measures on the working class, on the producers. Um, so the lo it, it creates this logic whereby you need to reintroduce um, a class system. So this is why we need to get rid of uh, competitive markets. Sorry, question? <coughs> Sorry. Oh. Elite institutions, I just want to follow. What, what you said elite institutions? Like it creates that? Like the corporate division of labor. Okay. You know the one we saw, uh, this one? Mm -hmm. So if you want to, if you want to, markets generate, markets rationalize the corporate division of labor, basically. If you're a work, if you're a, if you're a, if you're competing in that context, you're, it makes sense to have some managers above you to impose these harsh measures on you. So you reintroduce the corporate division of labor. And if you look at, workers when they've taken over factories and they've maintained um, they're operating within a, within a competitive market context, this is what they tend to do. I think this has happened in Argentina and places like that. Okay, so we've come to the end. We've, we've filled our four categories for our analysis. Like I say, we, this is very brief, very quick. We're moving quite quick. There's a lot to cover, but we can come back and explore these a little bit more after. We're going to have about half an hour left. Uh, for questions and answers. So we've got our analysis done, um, but before moving on to our vision, I just want to make another <coughs> kind of general point which I think is very important. Um, I think this essentially constitutes anti-capitalism, if you like, um, and most anti-capitalists focus on what they want to dismantle, what, the, what institutions, what systems we want to bring down. When we're dismantling these institutions, we need at the same time to be constructing new institutions, otherwise it's suicidal, yeah? But most anti-capitalists, I think, are actually guilty of this. Okay. Um, so we're going to look at... Okay, so we're going to now move over and we're going to start working on our vision side of things. So the first institution I want to highlight here is uh, self-managed work and consumer council so this is like one of the institutions that we advocate for participatory economics um, and this is our alternative to private ownership so work and work self-managed work and consumer councils basically this is a venue for production <coughs> this is a venue for consumption everybody in a participatory economy belongs to both a workers council and a consumer council um, and I just want to highlight what I mean by self-management because it's a very important aspect of participatory economics. It's a kind of like a, 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 a principle that guides decision making within the economy. And basically what it boils down to is that people have the same decisions in proportion to how much they are affected by the outcome of that decision. That's the guiding principle. So for example, just to illustrate the point, if I'm going to work and I'm, you know, I'm choosing what cold socks to wear to work, right, who gets to make that decision? So following this principle, I get to make it, no one else, right? If I'm at work, let's say this is our work, this is our workers' council, and us, us guys over here, we all work in one area, and we want to put some, put a radio on, but no one else can hear that radio, we get to make that decision, none of you guys, right? If there's something like um, we want to redecorate our workplace, the colour, and it affects everybody, but, you know, we want to choose a nice, we want to have an input into what colour we want to choose, say, for example, everybody has, has a say on that. So that's, the, that's basically how the self-management works. So there's no central committee, no top-down decision, no top-down. So that's basically the principle. We can, again, we can explore this a little bit further, if you like, uh, afterwards. Okay, so that's our first institution for our vision. And like I say, this is what we propose as an alternative to uh, private ownership. Uh, the second institution is what we call balanced job complex. And this is our alternative to uh, the corporate division of labor. So I mean, remember earlier, there was jobs are made up of bundles of tasks, and with the corporate division of labour, some people, the coordinator class, 
get to monopolise all of the empowering and desirable tasks in their work, and the working class get to do the disempowering and less desirable tasks. So to overcome this, this is a class division, this causes a class division. So to overcome this and to create classlessness, we need balanced job complexes, or this is what we propose. Um, and basically, ref you, you're kind of reformulating jobs, so you've still got tasks, everybody has a job, um, but the, the, at the heart of everybody's job, if you like, this is kind of like how I like to think of it, um, everybody has at the heart of their job something that they feel passionate about, something that they find desirable, something that they find uh, empowering. But in addition to doing that, everybody has a responsibility to also do their fair share of the disempowering uh, tasks and the less desirable tasks. And that's what these red dots symbolise around the outside. So that's a balanced job complex. Okay, so that's our second institution for um, our vision. And like I say, this is our alternative to the corporate division of labour. So this is how we overcome, this is how we overcome private owned, you know, the, class, the capitalist class division. This is how we overcome the coordinate class division. Um, okay, so we're moving on to our third institution, which is remuneration for effort and sacrifice. So this is what we advocate as an alternative to remuneration for ownership and bargaining power. So the bargaining power is gone because we've got balanced job complexes. Nobody has more bargaining power than anybody else in a, in a participatory economy. Yeah? So that's gone. Um, ownership's gone. But we do need uh, a criteria for remuneration. And what we advocate, uh, what we think is a good criteria, is that uh, you're remunerated for effort and sacrifice, which essentially boils down to the hard, if you work harder, you get more, and if you work longer, you get more. That's it. Okay? Uh, we can come back and talk about it. Okay, so there it is. There's our third institution, remuneration for effort and sacrifice. And our fourth institution, again, this is the most complicated one of the four. Um, this is our alternative to competitive markets. Uh, you could do a workshop on this, so I'm just going to, this is not, this is, nobody should be satisfied with what I'm saying, really, but it'll just give you a lot of taste. So we've already seen that we've got workers' councils, and we've already seen that we've got consumer councils. But the idea with participation planning is that it's a means of arriving at an economic plan, right? But without a central commit, without central planning, or without markets, this is this is what we propose for a classless economy. So the way in which it works is the Workers' Council submits what it is prepared to produce to a specialised workplace called a Isolation Facilitation Board, a fancy sounding, um, and the Consumer Council submit what they would like to consume for our, to the facilitation board and basically these people who, who work in, in this specialised workplace do some number crunching, do some analysis and then feed back to the workers council and to the consumer council and this process basically goes on through a, through a series of rounds until there is a, a mutually agreed upon plan for production and consumption. Yeah. Okay, so that's our fourth uh, institution, and basically that is the four institutions for a participatory economy that we advocate for, cla for classlessness. Um, I just want to say something very briefly about uh, the transition, because basically, so our analysis and our vision here, we've basically got a the transition from private ownership to self-managed work and consumer councils, the transition from corporate division of labour to balanced job complexes, the transition from remuneration for ownership and bargaining power to remuneration for effort and sacrifice, the transition from competitive markets to participatory planning. And essentially that is the revolution. It's the transition from capitalist economics to participatory economics. But we need to just say a little bit about what's going on in here. So this is the most important bit. Okay, so essentially what's important, first of all, I think is just to point out, you probably already got this anyway, but just to point out that we've done our analysis, we've done our vision, and these two impact on each other. 
we, you know, we inform each other. Uh, but both of these should inform our strategy. So when we're formulating that, when we're sitting, sitting down as organisers, um, we should be using our analysis and our vision to inform our strategy. But I just want to make three kind of quite general points about strategy uh, as well. Uh, the first is something that I think is just a truism, and it's internationally true, I think, and that is that to do this we will need a popular movement. The work in Stockholm, for example, will not necessarily work in London, where Jason lives, or in, say, Cape Town in South Africa. Right? So it's context specific. So like, if you look at the internationals of the past, they've tended to come up with a universal and kind of absolute strategies that they say apply everywhere. You know? And I think this is a major mistake, and it causes all kinds of problems and splits and stuff. So we say that, that strategy is context specific, but it needs to be informed by your analysis and your vision. And thirdly, um, to do with strategy and to do with the transition, we're not going to see like capitalism one step overnight jump participatory economics. It's going to be a series of progressive reforms. This is how we kind of uh, visualize it. So you could have like a, and those, those and it's those specific campaigns that you formulate that might be different here than in Cape Town or in London, right? So, um, and this is what we call non-reformist reforms. So they're, they're reforms, but they're intended to have an ultimate revolutionary outcome, yeah? Okay, oh, that's it. Uh, I thought we more. So this is, I'm, I'm writing this up as a pamphlet. Uh, I'm very interested in getting feedback off people. Any areas that aren't clear, any areas you think I've missed, anything you think that I've, um, I don't know, anything, basically. And this is my email address, so anybody who wants to email me after the conference can do so. And also, there is a website here, which is a very, this is the website for further information on participatory economics.